Hi friends, welcome back. Happy winter solstice, happy birthday Feyre, and happy day to me. This marks the day that I no longer have to deal with your where's the accord of frost and starlight comments. I'm done. This is my end of the year gift to you. If you guys watched my Mortal Instruments plot breakdown videos, I know that I said I was going to try and finish the trilogy by the end of the year and that's just not gonna happen. I can't break down three books in that allotted time. So I didn't wanna leave you hanging and I thought this was a appropriate plot breakdown. We can finish it off and it is winter holiday themed. So perfect. And once again, just to remind everybody, I started making these videos partially because I just needed to talk about them, but also because I'm trying to focus on books that are part of the cultural conversation. Um, you kind of almost need to know the plot to get certain references in the book community, but they are by authors that you might not want to support. So for all the comments asking me to do breakdowns for books that I genuinely love, um, I personally read right now don't feel comfortable doing that so that's what's up that's just a reminder but now we're just going to dive into the book um thank you as always to the artists always always linked in the description box and what else this is a short book this is the shortest book i think sarah j mass has ever written here we are now you have all the books at your fingertips at your disposal grab a snack grab a beverage and let's head back to valeris our story starts, we are back in the city of Starlight. We are following Feyre and Reese is MIA. And Feyre assures us that this is normal nowadays. Remember, this is directly after the war. So they're not just hanging out. Resand has to actually put his money where his mouth is and be the damn High Lord. So he is bopping around, trying to make sure that the alliances stay alliances. They're really trying to work on this peace treaty that hasn't fully been signed. So he's going off doing his job. Feyre, because remember, she's High Lady, she usually comes with him, but today, she has other plans. She's in her feels a lot. Where the, a lot of this takes place just in Feyre's mind. And she's kind of thinking about how her reaction to winter in Valeris is so different from every other winter in her life. Because remember, she was the sister that got forced to go hunt for her family. And in winter, that was a really horrible time. The winter is what started this whole damn thing. She said, quote, it had been a long, brutal winter that had brought me so deep in the woods that day nearly two years ago a long, brutal winter that had made me desperate enough to kill a wolf, that had eventually led me here, to this life, this happiness. And she says happiness like she kind of isn't sure if that's the right word. And this is when we're reminded, yeah, hi, everyone is traumatized. They just went through a horrible war on top of 50 years of being cursed by a crazy woman and being put in a cave. And also, in case you forgot, Resan died. Like, dead, dead, died. Feyre had to watch Resan die. Resan had to actually die. Like, he went to the land of the dead, or the, like, ether, whatever him and Amrin were swimming in. That's not, that's not a thing you can just kind of get over. So they honestly both, their coping mechanism, and I can relate, is they throw themselves into their work. So they're just kind of trying to keep busy so that they don't slip into stillness. Feyre says, when there's nothing but me in my mind, there's that memory of Rhys lying dead on the rocky ground, the King of Highburn snapping my father's neck, all those Illyrians blasted out of the sky and falling to earth as ashes. Not pretty happy thoughts going on in Feyre's mind right now. But what is the task that our High Lady is so worried about right now? Winter Solstice. Yes, she's done winter solstice before. She's never done one when she's like been fully part of the family and they're allowed to like take a day off and chill and enjoy themselves. So she's actually in the kitchen with Nuala, who is, remember, a spy, but also like a housekeeper, but also now a master chef. So she's quizzing Nuala on like, what? do we actually do for winter solstice? And Nuala's like, do not worry, girl. It is very chill. Like, remember, he is the most casual high lord, okay? She's like, really chill. We listen to music. We eat good food. We exchange presents. And Feyre's like, ooh, 
shit presence. Feyre is very excited to be able to have like a found family to exchange presents with but she's low-key stressed because she's never bought presents for them before and Nuala again is like listen it's really chill I cannot express to you they do this ceremony at the temple nobody goes we are very low-key here at the night court and Feyre has trouble believing her because remember the past like two years she has been in the spring court where Tammy, where are ya? Tammy extravaganza. He's a little over the top. Every event that Feyre has ever had to do, even like just when people come to ask Tamlin for help for things, like an audience with Tamlin, she has to get so dressed up, the jewels, the gowns, and she cannot believe that she is standing in the kitchen with her little ring that she stole from the weaver, mm -hmm, that ring, and she gets to wear leggings and sweaters and fleece lined boots the dream speaking of the friends and family that we're going to be buying presents for how's everyone doing where are they now so elaine is living with resan and Feyre in house of the wind she is just elaine nesta has gotten her own place in the city if you would like to know more yes i did a plot summary of a court of silver flames she apparently found the only apartment complex in all of the night court that um knows what poverty is good for her lucian is still in the night court he apparently went to the spring court to like try to talk to tamlin didn't go well he's not welcome there so he got a cute little space it's like on the river very chic remember lucian is elaine's mate and he is doing everything in his power to not be around <laughs> he will take any job that takes him out of the city days weeks at a time he does not want to touch that okay neither do we more Azriel, Cassian, all doing the same. They're around. Sometimes they sleep over. Feyre's like, damn, House of the Wind for a giant house. It feels a little crowded. Yeah, they're just, everyone's busy, everyone's stressed, but they're all alive. Omrin, as we know, has her own place and she has taken up puzzling. She just puzzles now. But Feyre hasn't just been sitting around worrying about holiday planning. She has been actively trying to help Valeris. Remember that it finally got attacked in the war, destroyed. So Feyre was hoping to be kind of in charge of rebuilding this city that she's grown to love so much, but the people of Valeris were so organized that she ended up, she found herself basically like just being wherever she could volunteer because people had already set up such great systems for rebuilding the city. So she's just kind of the person who stands in the kitchen and is like, are there any dishes to wash? But she does it, she does it with a lot of heart. She really does. She does help. <laughs> and she really, really loves her people and they love her back to the point where everywhere she tries to go recently to like volunteer to help, they turn her away because they're like, you need to rest. Like, we thank you. We love you. They clearly saw some like a little crazy in her eyes. They're like, you need to go take a nap and you need to go have a fun holiday. Like, you earned it. You were on the battlefield. We saw you the day we were attacked. You were right here helping us. Like, you are trying to pay back so much. We really want you to chill. And so they're, at this point, they're just giving her the silent treatment. Anytime she wants to help, they're like, please, help yourself. Resand finally makes an appearance in the mental, their weird, like, mate telepathy. He pops in. He's like, hey, girl, uh, sorry, I didn't message you back earlier because she did like put out feelers for, hey, where are you? He's like, I'm up with the Illyrians and normally that shouldn't take, like he's not that far away, right? Feyre thought because she, he didn't answer her message, he must be like very far away. He's like, I'm sorry, I just couldn't find the time to message you because Cassian is up here standing up for women as always, just ripping Devlin a new one. Devlin, remember, is like the head of the Illyrian warriors. He's, Cassian is like the general, but he is sort of the, I don't know, ranks, like the captain, the lieutenant. He's the one who is constantly in the camps and is in charge of the training and everything. He's like purely Illyrian because Cassian is like high ranked. They don't super love him, right? So Resand is like, yeah, I'm really just here for moral support. I'll see you later tonight. Hopefully Cassian cools down soon. Love ya. Bye. Speaking of resand, a little winter solstice gift for you. This is a dual POV book. Yes, now we are switching. What is resand really up to? It is nine o'clock in the morning and Cassian is 
pissed. Yes, he is indeed standing up for women. Feminist icon Cassian, feminist icon Rixand wishes he could do what Cassian does. Cassian is very, very angry because remember, this has been mentioned in other books, but the Illyrian society, first of all, never let women be warriors. And now that they're allowing them to train, they have to do like all of their women chores before they can come in the training ring. And Cassian is like, Okay, Rhysand is looking out over the Illyrian camp as it wakes up on this snowy morning and he sees the warriors warming up in their various training rings. The other men who didn't qualify to be warriors are attending various trades such as merchants, blacksmiths, etc. And for the females, drudgery. The women didn't see it as such. Their roles of cooking and cleaning, child rearing, clothes making, and laundry. There was pride and honor and good work to be found in them. But Resand is angry because they're expected to do it. And if they don't do it, they'll be punished. So Resand is not happy. Has Resand ever done laundry? I don't think so. So that's interesting. But anyway, women should only do that stuff if they want to. So yeah, the High Lord Resand is standing in the middle of the camp, just boiling with rage, watching women cook. Okay, so as I said, Cassian and Rhysand are here to make sure that Devlin keeps his promise of letting the Illyrian girlies practice without having to do all of their chores. And I guess he has not been sticking to that. And they've been kind of fighting this for, as I've said, a really long time, but they've decided like after the war, they're trying to make Prithian into something bigger and better and make these good changes. The Illyrians better do it too. So they're super tied to their traditions, but Cassian, is not backing down. Listen, pal, you and Illyria, we don't discriminate based on gender. Women, they, they have minds and they have souls as well as just hearts. And Rhysand is literally here just to be the backup because after Cassian does his long monologue about women's rights, Devlin just kind of looks at Cassian and is like, What makes you think you can talk to me? I take orders from my high lord, not you, little bat boy. And Rhysand is just like, what he said. And Devlin's like, got it boss, I will try harder. Poor Cassian, man. I understand why in A Court of Silver Flames he hates doing the like politics dance because, Ooh. To be fair, Rhysand is not the hard ass that we know and love because the Illyrian camp is in a really, precarious situation. They took the biggest losses in the war out of anybody. Remember, they called in the Illyrian warriors to help fight. Thousands of soldiers died. And they have never really felt like they're a part of Prithian. They're very other. They keep to themselves. They are Illyrians up in the mountains, right? They don't necessarily feel super warm and fuzzy about losing that many people and then also feeling not super patriotic, let's say. So he's trying to toe the line of like letting them deal with themselves, not feeling like they're being overseen by the High Lord, but he also is like people with grudges, if left to their own devices, like those feelings are only gonna get worse and we cannot handle our giant ass army not loving us, okay? But on page 13, yes, we are only on page 13. <laughs> I know you're wondering, gee, Carrie, I thought that this was supposed to be a sexy holiday book. Sarah J Maas promised us. Why are we talking about war and political strategy? Come on, don't worry. Resant has got you covered. So after they're done talking to Devlin, Cassian is like, boss, let's talk. And they start heading towards a cabin, which they have used as their like meeting room, center of communication, I suppose. Um, uh -huh. and as they're walking there, Resand lets us know that, quote, there wasn't a surface inside of that cabin where I hadn't taken Feyre. The kitchen table being my particular favorite, thanks to the raw initial days after we first mated, where I could barely stand to be near her and not be buried inside of her. How long ago, how distant those days seemed. Another lifetime ago. I need a holiday. Apparently Homeboy has been so busy that he has not been able to bury himself inside of Feyre for a while, and that's really just not okay. And it's also making him do silly things, like last week had been so stupidly busy and he'd been so desperate for the feel and taste of her. Oh God, I forgot. Okay, it's happening, it's happening now. He was so desperate for the taste of her 
that he took her during the flight down from the house of the wind to the townhouse, high above Valeris, for all to see, if it weren't for the cloaking he had thrown into place. It required some careful maneuvering, and I'd planned it for months now on actually making a moment of it, but with her against me like that alone in the skies, all it had taken was one look in those blue-gray eyes, and I was unfastening her pants. A moment later, he did the deed, and sent them nearly crashing into the rooftops, with Feyre just laughing. And Resand says, and I quote, it was not his finest moment. So yes, Resand spent months doing the mental calculations to figure out how could he screw his wife in the sky. <sighs> but back to the war planning. Cassian kind of chases Resand out of his little reverie, and he's like, listen, here's the update. Cassian has been staying with the Illyrians, so he's much more kind of in tune with what the vibes are in camp, and he's like, not good not good. There are more people who are very vocal with their unrest. Because remember, the Illyrians never liked Resand anyway. The whole Resand azriel cassian friendship, they had different reasons for hating all three of them, and then together they just really don't like this group. And so there's this kind of rumor or this shared feeling that Resand sent the Illyrians to the front lines where they lost so many people as revenge for how the Illyrians treated them. Which, like, if I was an Illyrian, that kind of tracks, okay? And so Cassian is like, listen, I don't feel good leaving. I'm gonna stay here over Solstice and, like, make sure everything's okay. And Rhysand is like, absolutely not. He is so ready for this holiday. He is like, you are going to come to the House of the Wind. You're gonna open presents. We're gonna all be one happy family and you are going to enjoy it. He like suddenly becomes that mom that knows that the family doesn't like each other, but like, this is gonna be perfect. Reesey, Reesey baby. <sighs> Cassian kind of chuckles and he's like, okay, mom. And then he swallows and he's like, is, uh, Mm. And Rhysand is like, yeah, both sisters are coming. <laughs> Man up, Cassian. Who's afraid of the big bad nest? Uh, yeah, he, he, well, we'll get into it. But both of the sisters are coming. Rhysand says whether they like it or not. Rhysand is like, especially Nesta. Nesta's gonna be there and Nesta's gonna act nice because she owes Feyre that much. And this is when we learned Rhysand has been like throwing jobs her way anything to get her to like live a life that isn't just kind of going from her apartment to the bar to apartment to the bar and spending all of his money by the way. Resand is like, why don't you talk to her over solstice? Cassian like, you know, talk a little sense into her. And Cassian is like, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. And Resand is like, Actually, you're right. Yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. Just come, have a good time. It's also Feyre's birthday and she's gonna be 21. Oh, it hit me for a moment how small that number was. Resand very quickly goes into this horrible spiral of like, oh my God, wait a second. I'm 500 years old and I just married a 21 year old. She never got to live a life. She never got to be normal. She's shackled to me. We're mated. Now she's a high lady. She has all of this responsibility. She's never going to live like normally and have fun. And Cassian is like, hey, hey, hi, hey. Ooh, that looked bad. And Resand is like, oh man, did I fuck up? Cassian is like, it's your inner saboteur talking. You know that you love her. It honestly makes me kind of sick and jealous when I look at you guys, how happy and in love you are. Cassian's like, I thought all the stuff they said about the mating bond was bullshit like the whole happily ever after true love shit, but damn it, you two came along. And then Resand is like, I get that, I, f I know, I know that, but she's also 21 years old. And Cassian says, your mother was 18 to your father's 900. Ex pardon? And Resand is like, yes, Cassian, and she was fucking miserable. Like, yeah, his mom and dad were mates, but she was unhappy, and his dad was a tool bag. And Cassian's like, okay, okay, bad example. You know I'm not good with words, but like, Feyre isn't your mom, and you are not your dad. You can be happy. She wants to be with you. Can we just chill and like accept one good thing in our life? Like, where is this coming from? Are things good? And Rhysand is like, yes, everything, everything is good. And that's the fucking problem, Cassian. He says, there's no way that anyone can be this happy and not pay for it. And Cassian is just like deadpan. He's like, you died. He's like, you died 
big. Like, it was a big dying. And Rhysand is like, it wasn't enough. <laughs> but so what follows is basically Cassian and Rhysand just having a further little therapy session, men sharing their emotions. You can tell that they're getting there. Every day, they're one step closer to this, like, elusive happiness that they seek. They need this holiday. <laughs> And you thought I was leaving you with just one winter solstice gift? No, ma'am. When I said this was a dual POV, I lied. Welcome to Cassian's POV, everybody. Here we go. Resand leaves, goes back to Valeris, and Cassian cannot stand to be there alone. He is so pissed at everything that has occurred. He's like, I need to go cool down. I need to go fly. And so he just takes off. He's flying around to cool off and just some weird cryptic Sarah J Mass shit starts to go down so I'm gonna mention it but I know it's gonna come into play later so here it is. Um, He's flying around, he's looking down at the mountains and he thinks to himself that most high fae believe that Illyrians were the greatest menace in these mountains but they didn't realize that far worse things prod between the peaks. Some of them hunting on the winds, some of them crawling out from deep caverns in the rock itself. He mentions that Feyre had faced some of those things to save Resand. So we're assuming he's talking about like the old gods, like the weaver, the bone carver, etc. But he doesn't. Mm. Cassian says he wonders if his brother Resand ever told her what dwelled in these mountains. What dwells in these mountains, Cassian? He keeps flying and he gets to Ramiel, which is the peak that is the peak in the night court um you know the three mountains and the stars insignia yeah that mountain that's where they do the blood rite so then we just get cassian kind of reminiscing on the blood rite reminding us what it is because maybe that comes into play in a court of silver flames i don't know i think sarah j mass just really likes writing about the blood rite so mm. and then he makes another stop at a little mountain peak that nobody else really knows about, nobody else really cares about. And it's abandoned because whatever village stood there is nothing but ash. This is Cassian's birthplace. If you remember, the reason why the Illyrians really hate Cassian is because he's a bastard and his mother was an unwed mother. When it was found out that she was pregnant, they threw her, like the villagers, threw her out into the snow to just fend for herself. And then after she gave birth, she like passed Cassian off so that he could live like as a soldier and not be stuck in this crazy village. And by the time he was strong enough to come back and rescue her, she was gone. He made sure everyone responsible for her suffering and torment was dealt with. That means that there is nothing but cinders and debris where his hometown once stood. And this has been centuries and Cassian's like thinking about it. He's standing in the ruins of his birthplace and he like does a little check in with himself and he's like, no regrets, none. Mm -mm. The only thing he wishes he could change is that by the time he came back, right, his mom is gone and the villagers refused to tell him where she was buried. And that makes me think is she dead? Just saying. But that's something that Cassian's really passionate about is hopefully one day he will find his mother's bones and he can bury her in Valeris, which he sees as a place full of warmth and love and happiness. In the meantime, he set up like this kind of makeshift memorial for her and he just kind of sits there and lets it out. Let it out, Cassian. And this is when we kind of get why he's so obsessed with women's rights. He wants the women to be able to be strong and to not let these Illyrian men push them around and he's really doing everything that he's doing in the camp right now he's doing for his mom and he thinks that the Illyrians as much pain as they have brought him as a culture um which he's a part of remember he's Illyrian right he he still loves his people and he's like we can be better one day and that's what he's pushing for and that kind of recenters him and he's able to go back to the camp with kind of a renewed sense. Mm. He turns to fly back to the camp when he looks in the direction of Valeris and he's like, ah, Valeris. And then he's like, ugh, because he thinks of who's there and who's there? Miss Nesta, oh yeah. His heart kind of stutters and then he's like, no, no. I have spent the last few hours flying around to cool down. I am not about to think about this woman who definitely does not make me cool down. He is like, this is not the time or the place to be thinking about her and apparently he quote 
rarely allows himself to think of her anyway. It didn't usually end well for whoever was in the sparring ring with him. So we put that aside. He heads back to see what he can do for the Illyrians. But now we're back with Feyre, who has made her way to the Rainbow, which, as we remember, is the art district of Valeris. It's where she felt very accepted. It's where she ran immediately to protect it when Valeris got attacked, right? So she's heading there. She wants to spend her coin and pick up some Winter Solstice presents, okay? It is beautiful. We get a gorgeous little scene of the Arts District. There is the light dusting of the first snow, and then everything is covered in evergreens and brass bells, and Feyre just sees blood and destruction because she just can't get over the fact that like just a couple months ago this was completely destroyed and she's just kind of standing there like waiting for the glamour to go away she's like everything is shiny and new but it's shiny and new because everything got destroyed um so she's just having a really hard time accepting the holiday spirit when it comes so directly after war basically resand and Feyre are having the same problem of they're so happy but they're so guilty for feeling happy right as she's walking down the street where most of the galleries are she looks at one particular spot that is just still kind of a pile of rubble it hasn't been fixed up and she goes into her own little spiral of like oh my god, did I know them? Did I meet them? Where are they? Did they have family? Were there people in the blah, 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 When she hears a kind voice behind her say, they got out. The voice um, is coming from a fairy that Feyre recognizes during the attack. They kind of cross paths. She was standing at her shop door with a rusted pipe raised over her shoulder, ready to kill some Hiberian soldiers and protecting a ton of people who took shelter inside her gallery. She is, looks like a cinnamon roll, but could kill you. Where are you? Racina. Yes, Racina. Friendly Fey of the Rainbow. Feyre's really awkward. As we know, like, growing up didn't really have time to ever try to make friends even when she first met more she was very much like can i are we can we be friends so Feyre's just a little little awkward so Feyre's like i'm so glad to hear that and then she's just they both kind of stare at each other like and then Feyre's like it's snowing the fairy's like yes it is snowing. I love the green. Thank it you. It really brings out the green in your eyes. They're blue, but Sorry, they're you know, blue. That's... And the fairy is being really nice. Like, she can clearly see that Feyre's having a little, you know, meltdown mentally. Um, Because also Feyre's like, I'm a high lady. Is it okay for me to be friends with you? Like, I would like to be friends with you, but is this weird? Because it feels weird, but... I don't want to make it weird. And Feyre then just kind of goes down the street and is like, are they okay? Are they okay? Are they okay? And obviously some of them are not, particularly one gallery owner who was this older woman who was killed in the attack. Feyre's like, well, like, did she have family? Because Feyre's thinking, I would like to go and offer my condolences to her family. And Racina is like, oh, she does, but they don't want to keep the gallery if you want it they're selling it. And Feyre was like, oh, whoa, no, no, no. That wasn't why I was asking. And she's like, besides, what would I do with a gallery, right? And Racina's like, isn't that your whole thing is that you're the artist? Use a gallery, get your own space, girl. And Racina's like, and either way, even if you aren't shopping for gallery space, you don't have to like walk around here like you're creeping around, okay? You're, you're welcome here, right? And Feyre's like, because I'm high lady and racina's like no girl because you're one of us we saw you fight for us you're welcome just as a neighbor as an artist the rainbow's your home too Feyre is like fighting back tears and so she just kind of shakes racina's hand and is like i gotta go she's like by the way hey like i do have a gallery space and once a week we get together a group of us and we just paint if you want to come like no pressure just to be around other people you are so welcome and she's like and just so you know we keep away from you to give you your privacy we hope that you know that we love you she says there isn't a single one of us who doesn't know and remember who isn't grateful that you came here and fought for us and Feyre leaves with a smile Feyre has her shopping to do, so she heads over to the Palace of Thread and Jewels, and she's perusing the jewelry shops when an arm links through hers. And who enters? But more, more kind of leans in and is like, Amran would love you forever if you got her those sapphires for winter solstice. And Feyre looks at the price tag and is like, 
somehow I don't feel like my wallet would feel the same. And this is when Moore reminds us that Resand is richer than God. They have, there is no end to their wealth. Apparently, quote, she could buy a bathtub full of egg-sized sapphires and barely make a dent in Resand's accounts. Feyre's very uncomfortable with having money. <laughs> and so she's just kind of like, aha, uh -huh, okay. And they leave the shop with no egg-sized sapphires. And they end up just walking around having little girl gossip session shopping. More, who's coming to the solstice party? Amrin is coming and she is maybe bringing Varian because they're definitely a thing now, so that's exciting. Feyre says something weird about like, I've seen you hanging out at Rita's a lot lately. Rita's is like the dance place that her and Asriel love. She's like, do you have anybody there you know she pulls the like classic holiday like so you got any boyfriend and more shuts that right down Feyre realizes that like okay okay more is not ready to tell everybody what she told Feyre so remember in the last book more mentioned that she is interested in women and hasn't really told people who might be crushing on her. She's just not, that's not something she's ready to talk about with her family. So more changes the subject. She's like, anyway, so uh, you and Resand are gonna be my date tonight. And Feyre's like, ooh, where are we going? And she's like, the Court of Nightmares. Oh. Yes, they're going to the Court of Nightmares, aka Hewn City, to wish everybody a merry solstice. Nobody wants to do it, but somebody's got to, and so tonight's the night. Feyre gets a little cagey. She's like, why are you telling me this just like a few hours in advance? Like, do you not trust me? Because remember, she's gone through like two years of nobody telling her the plan, and she, so she's really picky about that. She's like, why am I only getting this news a couple hours in advance? And more is like, that was my bad, honestly. Resan doesn't know either. I got some intel that makes it important that we show up tonight. What is that intel, we ask? Seems like Asriel, who again is the spy master, so he knows everything, he just found out that Eris will be at the Court of Nightmares tonight. And Moore just kind of wants to check how cozy Eris, who is, remember, Lucian's older brother, heir to the Autumn Court, just wants to see how cozy he's gotten with her father because during the war, they were like a little too friendly and they're literally like her two least favorite people on the planet. So we don't want them getting too cozy. We gotta keep an eye. So, Hewn City, tonight. I also just gotta mention this. This was totally in passing, but I feel like it would be wrong of me to leave this out. Um, they are walking around having this conversation. Feyre's looking at the city, how lovely it looks. It's kind of dressed up like a Christmas market, you know? It's got fey lights everywhere twinkling and there's snow falling and she gets a vision of a painting. And Feyre has this weird thing where whenever she sees something that she wants to paint, it also comes with the title of the painting. So she has this vision. She looks at the market. She's like, I'm gonna paint it. And what's it gonna be called? <clears throat> Frost and Starlight. A few hours later, Feyre is back at House of the Wind uh, doing paperwork because she has somehow accidentally become Resan's secretary slash accountant. She is appalled by the mess of paperwork and she's just like, I can't. I can't. So she gets to work. Resand walks in. He immediately starts stripping and he is like, oh, I am so glad to be home. I was thinking about the flying sex all day. He's about to pounce on her when she is like, up, up. when's the last time you ate? Resand Because she takes a look at him and even though he's probably always good looking, he looks tired. Like he looks like he's going to faint. And she is like, you are going to eat? You are going to bathe? And then we can talk, okay? He agrees. He sulks a little bit. He tucks his wings in. He jumps in the shower. She goes down to the kitchen and gets him some food. Then they have this like fussing match. So they're kind of yelling at each other about who is more worried about each other. Resand is like, you're too fussy. And Favor's like, oh yeah, mother hen? Let's rewind the tape. 
And this is where we get this weird mention of her changed menstrual cycle. Uh, apparently now that she's Faye, you only get your period twice a year, which sounds great, until you also realize that that means they are excruciating. And so she had her first Faye experience and apparently it was just insanity and Resand had to stay at her bedside. Don't worry, if you're wondering, he's not scared of little blood. All blood's the same. He's a warrior. He's like, ah, it's fine. <laughs> but then she says, at least it means the contraceptive that Resand is taking works. And then she's like, maybe we should just have the damn baby so that I don't have to deal with a period anymore. Then she reminds us, dear reader, that she wants to experience life with Resand before having a child. She is 21 years old. She spent most of that just thinking about how to survive and then fighting off fairies. She wants to experience life, learn how to fly a little bit better, maybe. You know, she's got she's got a list of things she wants to do. But also, regardless of that, they are too damn busy to think about babies, okay? And she's also like, ooh, damn, put that on my to-do list. I need to warn Nesta and Elaine about this period pain because it's so bad. And she's like, I feel like Nesta would probably kill someone. Elaine would be, you know, weak in her room. And Lucian couldn't help himself. He would probably come to help. And Elaine would be too damn polite to turn him away. And then Elaine would just ignore him until he left her alone, which she has been doing, by the way. And that is why he is never around. And she just hangs out in her garden or in the kitchen with the twins. Resand is literally like, where did you go? And she kind of snaps back. She's like, ooh, right freshly bathed naked husband. Get back to the plot, girl. She's like, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. I was just, I was thinking about my sisters. And Rhysand is like, ugh. <laughs> and Favor's like, can you not, can you not do that? He's like, I can't help it. And he gives the worst explanation for why he hates Nesta and not Elaine. He openly hates Nesta, but is really nice to Elaine, right? And Favor's like, what is up with that? And Rhysand says, Elaine is, Elaine. What? Favor's like, they both didn't help me at the cottage, right? Like, you understand that they both did the same shit. It doesn't make sense that you hate one and not the other just because Elaine is Elaine. Resand is pretty much just like, you can't tell me what to do. I don't blame Elaine. Nesta's fucking insane. Actually, he says, Nesta is Illyrian. Resand meant that as a compliment, but she's an Illyrian at heart. There's no excuse for her behavior. Whatever that means, like, uh, he said nothing. He's like, I don't know, man, just Elaine is just different. I just don't like Nesta. The end. And so Resand is like, maybe that will be my solstice gift to you. I will forgive Nesta. And Feyre is like, honestly, with the attitude you are giving me right now, mister, you are not getting any winter solstice present. It's so bizarre that this book revolves around a holiday because most of it is just people being damaged. So anyway, they have a cute moment um, talking about what happened at the rainbow and Resand is sort of like, well, are you gonna go to that painting club? Because that sounds like a really good idea. He's basically like, I really think you should do it. Like, if you want to, you should go. But Feyre is still in this phase of, like, extreme guilt, and she's like, I, I can't have fun until everybody's having fun. And so she's sort of like, yeah, well, I'll think about it. This is when Resand is like, by the way, uh, speaking of solstice gifts, it's also your birthday girly. And he goes into this long speech about how like, isn't it so romantic that you were born on the longest night of the year? It's almost like you were meant to be mine. And this is when we get confirmation from Feyre that she actually kind of started having a little crush on Resand, even under the mountain. She said, I thought it was because I was going through something extremely traumatic, but you are still the only person I always felt I was able to talk to. I think my heart knew you were mine long before I ever realized it. And then things start to get a little heated because this is a Sarah J. Mass book and the patron saint of great timing knocks on the door. She's basically like, hey guys, we do need to leave soon and it takes Resand hours to get ready. So like, chop chop, we've got a date. And off we go to the court of nightmares. And oh, you thought there were gonna be three POVs in this book? It's winter solstice, you get another one. We're gonna hear from Moore, can you believe? Moore has made it to the Court of Nightmares and she hates it, as we know. Her evil, evil, evil father named Kier, he acts as the head of the Court of Nightmares while Resand is away in Valeris. Her evil father is there, but also Eris, who, pop quiz, what was he? Her fiance and 
In order to kind of get out of it, she convinced Cassian to sleep with her so that she wasn't pure anymore. And Eris did not want uh, Cassian's seconds. So that never happened. And uh, mysteries abound about this man. No spoilers for A Court of Silver Flames, but he definitely lets us know that there is much more to the whole engagement situation than we know or anyone in the inner circle knows. He's just kind of like, that's a story for more to tell. Why don't you ask her? But maybe I'm not as evil as you think I am. So pay attention to this part, okay? So they're in the Court of Nightmares and Moore looks at Eris and as she looks at him. She gets a flashback to that day. All she remembers is warm, buttery sunlight cutting through the leaves above her from where she lay, where she was thrown on the ground. Everything hurt. She couldn't move. As she's laying there, just focused on this pain that feels like living fire, she hears six sets of feet crunching towards her through the leaves. She hears someone swear, and then the entire group goes silent. She realizes it must be the border guard and his patrol, and then she hears someone say, don't touch her. The words weren't a warning to protect her or to defend her. She knew the voice that spoke, dreaded hearing it, and felt him approaching now, felt each reverberation in the leaves, the moss, the roots, as if the very land shuddered before him. No one touches her, Ares. The moment we do, she's our responsibility. And then another guard that he's with is like, but they nailed a- No one touches her. That's when Moore remembers how they pinned her down and how they nailed three massive nails into her body with a note. That would be uh, her family, hence why she doesn't like going home for the holidays, right? A pale face appeared above her, blocking out the leaves above. Unmoved, impassive. I take it you don't want to live here, Morgan. And she thought she'd rather die. He must have seen it in her eyes and a small smile curved on his lips. Thought so. Eris straightened and turned, and at that moment Moore wished she could grow claws like Reese, could rip out that pale throat, but that was not her gift. Her gift had left her here, broken and bleeding. One of the guards is like, we can't leave her here. And Eris is like, yeah, we can, and we will. Her family chose to deal with her like garbage, and I've already told them my decision in the matter. I'm not in the habit of fucking Illyrian leftovers move out. And that's all we know about that situation. What is Moore's gift? Sarah. Feyre kind of nudges Moore uh, because she sees her going down her own horrible memory lane. And we're back at the Court of Nightmares. Resand is like, what's up, buddy? What are you doing here? And Eris is like, oh, happy solstice. So Resand plays the role of like asshole high lord and he's like buddying it up with Kier and Eris. And as one does during the holidays, we talk about family. What is daddy Autumn Court up to? Baron. Let's talk about him. Baron is apparently very interested in expanding his court, um, taking advantage of the post-war chaos. And everyone else has kind of agreed to like not be a piece of shit and not do that. So that's not good to hear. And if you're wondering like what other space on that island is there? Like, is he at war with the other courts? No, ma'am. Think of the human realms, that little tip of the island. Yeah. He really wants to expand and bring the entire island under rule of the Fae. And Brisand is like, hey, we all agreed not to fucking do that. Eris, uh, you're supposed to be keeping an eye on your dad, right? We've agreed to kind of let you do you as long as you do us a solid and keep your crazy dad in line. And Eris is like, babe, look at a map. He's like, what court borders the human realms? What court would most easily be expanding into the human realms? Why are you talking to me when you could go talk to Tam Tam, okay? He's the one who would be expanding into the human realms. And by the way, Tam Tam is number three on Moore's shit list, right? So she is just like, I am surrounded by men I hate. This is not a good time for her. And she's honestly having a really horrible internal battle with herself because she's so strong. She knows that she is like 
a strong, independent woman who's just been through a lot of shit. And she wants to be able to, like, say something to these men that have just ruined her life. But she stands there in silence. And the longer she takes to think of something to say, the more that she gets upset with herself for not saying anything. And she ends up storming out of the night court, having said not a single word. We are back at House of the Wind and Azriel finally makes an appearance. Resand and Azriel are having a little meeting. Uh, remember, he is the spy master, so he's gonna give us some updates on the world. But before that, Sarah just throws in a little snippet uh, to remind us that he has these powers that are shadows. So like they both, Cassian and Azrael both have these siphons and they both have like an Illyrian power, but he also has this weird like shadow wielding thing um, that apparently can't be explained because no one knows where his powers came from, how he got them, um, and even Illyrians or High Fae, like nobody knows. Keep a pin in that one, all right? Azrael is, as always, uh, the bearer of bad news. He basically came back from the Illyrian camp and he's like, yeah, it's worse than we thought in terms of like the descent and how many people, like even the women, which apparently is like a uh, shot to the heart. The women aren't on Resand's side either, but Resand is like, what am I supposed to do? Because I can't disband them because they're our biggest army and we need them. And I can't like banish them. Where the fuck are they gonna go? Like, even if I play nice to them, like that doesn't seem to be working either. Like my charm has no effect. And why do we still need an army in times of peace? Well, the mortal queens, as you remember, are doing shady shit. They were supposed to, like, after the war, just go back to their respected kingdoms, and they seem to, like, be sticking together. The one good queen, where are ya? Vasa. Vasa apparently got, like, sort of broken out of her curse just for a little bit. She has like a small amount of time where she's allowed to be free until she has to return to her cursed lake or whatever. So actually her, Jurian, and now Lucian a little bit are working together to figure out the queens and all of that nonsense. So for now, it's kind of the mortal queens are kind of handled, but if it comes to it, we need the Illyrians on our side. Also speaking of Lucian, like what's up with him? And Asriel's like, don't know, don't care. Resand is like, you are our spy master. Like that is literally your job is to know what everyone does at all times. What do you mean you don't know? And Azriel's just kind of like, I don't, I don't particularly pay attention to him. And Resand is like, why the fuck not Azriel? Come on, like I'm at my wits end here. There was not a flicker of emotion on Azriel's face. He's Elaine's mate, he said. Resand waited. It would be an invasion of her privacy to track him. And Resand is just like, my dude. And he goes to say something, but Asriel's siphons guttered, the stones turning as dark and foreboding as the deepest sea. So Resand changes the subject. But yeah, Asriel wants nothing, nothing to do with this. Mm. But just in case you're worried for Azzy, no, it is confirmed that we will not be exchanging presents with the sisters, so he doesn't have to worry about getting his not-girlfriend mated with other guy, weird something-something, a gift. <laughs> and another update, Briaxis. What's up with that crazy little library demon that we were supposed to be tracking and capturing after the war? No sign, no clue. And Resand is like, you know what? That's okay. Let Briaxis enjoy the solstice. End scene. <laughs> but back at the Illyrian camp, Cassian is looking out over the horizon and he feels it in the air. There's a storm coming, a big one. And he's like, damn, this is gonna snow people in four days. So he decides to go on a little mission he goes shopping. He walks into one of their stores and he's greeted by a woman who he immediately is like, ooh, you and Nesta would be besties. Like, same energy, not sure if I feel safe in this store. She looks ready to fight and looks really territorial and Cassian is like, ah, I know how to deal with these women. And he's basically like, hello there. I respect that you are a female owner of a shop and I understand that people don't like that, but I see you. And that's about all it takes. And she's like, hi, I'm Emery. Wonder if we'll see her again. He's basically like, listen, there's a huge storm coming. 
you have a ton of blankets and coats and boots and blah, 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 blah. Can you please give me everything that you have? And he just throws a ton of money at her. And she's like, I don't feel comfortable taking this much money from you. Like this isn't a charity. Like you aren't doing me a favor by pitying me. And Cassian's like, okay, then give me the change. But like, you can also consider that extra money the delivery fees because I've got a job for you, soldier. And he basically wants her to take all of that that he just purchased. And because she's a local, she is more aware of which families need extra help this winter. He's like, I want you to pass out all of this stuff. And Emery is like, you knew it the second you walked into this shop. People don't really like me here. And Cassian's like, well, we're in the same boat. So, and he's like, just tell them that it's a gift from the High Lord. And Emery's like, not from you? The man who had this idea and purchased all of these goods? And Cassian's like, nope, it's uh, better, better that it comes not from me. Tell them it's from Reese. So Emery agrees. She says, happy solstice. And as Cassian's walking out, he's like, by the way, if anybody gives you trouble, you just call me. Her narrow chin rose. I'm sure I won't need to. Fire in those words. Emery would make those families take them, whether they wanted to or not. He'd seen that fire before, and he half wondered what might happen if the two of them ever met, and what might come of it. Speaking of those sisters, what's up with Feyre? She's having a damn panic attack, that's what. She has decided to go to the painting club and she's just sort of freaking out. She didn't know if there would be supplies there. So she's like, well, I gotta bring my paint and then I've gotta bring my canvas, but I don't wanna fly there because I can't fly with a canvas, but I don't wanna walk there because I'm gonna be really cold and I'm gonna look crazy and then I don't wanna blah, blah, blah. She's having a rough go at it and I feel you, girl. And now she's just standing outside the door, palm sweaty mom spaghetti because uh, she just doesn't know if she can take that step. She's never painted in front of people before. Remember, she like, that's a big plot point is that she does not share her artwork easily, right? And now she's gonna go paint out in the open with a room full of people. And what she's most scared of is like, what the fuck is she gonna paint? Because everything in her head right now is just gore from the war. So like, is that okay? Is she just, she's, you know, you know. Her spiraling is broken by a little tug on the bond and Resand's voice is like, you good, girl? Resand, by the way, is going to the spring court tomorrow. He's gonna investigate what Eris said about like, you need to check on the spring court, expanding their borders kind of thing. He offered to Feyre, he's like, you can come along if you want to because they don't hide things from each other anymore. And Feyre was very much like, no, thank you. Thanks. Feyre said, I might owe Tamlin my mate's life. I might have told him that I wish him peace and happiness, but I did not wish to see him, not for a long while, perhaps forever. And Feyre's like, I'm gonna get in there eventually. I'm doing okay. And Resand is like, you want me to come with you? And Feyre is like, to paint? You've never painted before. To which Resand gives us this lovely little layout of what he would do and how he's a great nude model. And that little chuckle that Resand gets out of her powers her through the doorway into the gallery. Feyre locks in. She finds an open spot. She finds a stool. She sits down. Nobody bothers her. Everyone's doing their own thing. Nobody even really says hi, which she does not mind. And she just sits down and starts to paint. And it's very much like the world fades to black. She stays way later. When she finally looks up, pretty much everybody is gone. And she just like got it out. Whatever she needed, it was out of her. And what did she paint? you might ask. She looks up at the canvas and sees her own face staring back at her. She painted what she saw in the Ouroboros mirror. If you remember, the bone carver made her look in that mirror in order to prove that she was a strong ally and so he would join her in the war. You remember this? The Ouroboros shows you who you really are. No trying to make you look pretty, like every evil little thing that is inside all of us is just out there to see. And that is what she drew. She painted herself, that beast of scale and claw and darkness, rage and joy and cold. I had not run from it and I will not run from it now. And it felt like the first stitch in closing a wound. She scans the gallery and like I said, pretty much everybody is gone and the paint is still wet. So she's like, I'm just gonna find a place to store this so that it will dry. And then I'm gonna take it home, but I'm probably gonna shove it in a closet. She's like, this is for my eyes only. Nobody needs to see this, but I'm glad it's out there. 
Now, while Feyre is closing her wounds, Resand is jetting off to a place where many of them originated. He's in the spring court. He winnows there, and when he lands, he immediately realizes something is wrong. There is still definitely, like, life. Like, it is springtime. There's that lovely breeze. He can smell the lilacs. But it's also really empty. And as he's walking up to Tamlin's home, all of the roses that grew up his beautiful manor are now just a tangle of thorns. The fountains are broken. Everything is just weeds. And again, no one is around. He walks up to the front door and there are just two huge claw marks down the front of the wooden doors. So that's not good. And strangely enough, when Resand knocks on these doors, someone opens it. And who is it? Tamlin. No household staff, just the High Lord himself answering his own front door. He looks haggard. The green eyes that met Resand's weren't the ones that he was accustomed to. They were haunted, bleak, not a spark. And Tamlin is basically like, listen, if you came here to gloat that you have my girlfriend, please save it. Like it is, I am, I'm done. And Resand realizes that, you know, Lucian has come back many times to the spring court trying to like just see Tamlin. And Resand realizes that it's not out of loyalty, it's out of pity. He's pitiful right now. The entire house is just destroyed and empty and dusty and as we know like he has anger issues so when he just explodes in rage no one cleans up that mess so like all of the rooms are trashed except for one which is where tamlin lets them take a seat and resand gets down to business he's like listen tamlin what's up with this rumor i heard about you expanding your borders and tamlin is just like come look around man do i have an army who's expanding the borders just me like remember Feyre destroyed the spring court from the inside none of his guards are loyal to him anymore his household staff has left him everybody nobody gives a shit about the high lord of the spring court he's like who would i order to go fight and expand my border So they start talking a little bit and Resand is like, well, okay, you don't have anybody, but like you can use my guards to help guard the border because remember there used to be a wall separating the human and the fey realm and that is gone now. So somebody needs to guard it for the simple sake of like, we don't want humans wandering into the fey realm. <laughs> like, oh no. And Tamlin is like, I'm not gonna let a single person from your shitty ass court into my space. No, thank you pack it up buddy like can can we just can you just go home please resand says you deserve everything that's befallen you you deserve this pathetic empty house i don't care if you offered that kernel of life to save me i don't care that you still love my mate i don't care that you saved her from highburn or a thousand enemies before that i hope you live the rest of your miserable life alone here it's far more satisfying than slaughtering you and then he sees tamlin kind of get angry and resand is like oh yeah come on man like resand also wants to fight like resand isn't this controlled 500 year old wise man he has some anger that he needs to burn off too so he's like yeah tamlin come on bring out those fangs but tamlin only stares and after a heartbeat his eyes lowered to the desk get out resand blinked the only sign of his surprise. Not in the mood for a brawl, Tamlin? He didn't bother to look up at Resand again. Get out, was all Tamlin said. Tamlin was broken, broken from his own actions, his own choices. It's not my concern. He doesn't deserve my pity. But as I winnowed away, the dark wind dripping around me, a strange sort of hollowness took root in my stomach. Tamlin didn't have any shields around the house. None to prevent anyone from winnowing in, to guard against enemies that might appear in his bedroom and slit his throat. It was almost as if he was waiting for someone to do it. But back at the night court, Solstice is fast approaching, so Feyre buys a shit ton of pine branches in order to decorate the house, and she just has it in a pile in the foyer. Cassian shows up from the Illyrian camp, and he sees what's going on, and he's immediately like, where's the wine and they get sh wasted and decorate the house 
Azriel pops in and he's like, Oh, God. He, quote, takes one look at our drunken attempts at decorating and sets about fixing it before anyone else could see. Asriel, truly out here, keeping the world spinning. He's literally like, it's like you tried to make it look ugly. Like, what? What? But, of course, then Resand and Moore stroll in and they immediately know, like, what Asriel fixed and what he didn't. They're like, oh, yeah, that was Cassian. Asriel tried to cover that one up. So apparently this is not new. Drunken Cassian, the only new thing is Feyre has helped, apparently. Omrin walks in in a giant coat that makes her look like a, quote, angry snowball, according to Cassian. And what about her other sister? What's up with Elaine? Elaine does not leave the kitchen in this book. I want you to know she is, like, living with the twins in the kitchen. Feyre's like, hey girly, what's up? Like, FYI, Nesta's coming. And Elaine is sort of like, honestly, Nesta has made it pretty clear that she doesn't want anything to do with us and that she wants her life to be very separate from ours. And Feyre's really shocked to hear that she said that to Elaine because no matter what, Nesta has always had a soft spot for Elaine, which to this day, like, doesn't super make sense. But anyway, so for Nesta to say, like, she doesn't want Elaine as part of her life, that's a red flag. Like, she's gone further than she's gone before. But Elaine also seems to be having kind of a bad day. So Feyre's like, I'm not gonna push it. Like, let's change the subject. Let's set the table. They grab the dishes that they've been preparing. Feyre and Elaine walk out into the dining room and Asriel doesn't even say hello to Elaine. He just jumps up, grabs the giant potato casserole out of her hands and is like, sit down, I'll do the rest. <laughs> Elaine scurries off to her room. She's like, ooh, gotta get something, bye. And she zooms out. And then Cassian starts to eat, like some of the food is on the table. So he starts to fill up his plate and Asriel blows a gasket. Like this is the man who doesn't show emotion on his face ever, right? And he is like Cassian, wait till everyone is seated. He gets really, really mad. And everyone just kind of goes quiet and Feyre kind of on the mental bond is like, Reese? <laughs> Resand is like, listen, it's an old wound. It traces back to how Asriel's mom was treated. So his mom was treated horrifically. And Asriel is just really passionate about women and, and housemakers being appreciated and respected. And Feyre's like, but we always eat. Like, remember, they're the casual night court, right? She's like, but, you know, we always just kind of eat whenever. Like, we've never played by those rules before. And Resand is like, it's just a thing that strikes at odd times. And it's true. Like, sometimes you have things in your past that just one thing sets you off. And so for some reason today, Cassian eating before everyone was seated set Azrael off. And that's something we've never seen from him before. So we get a charming dinner conversation. Omren she is now not what she was, right? Like she was some old infinite scary monster god thing. And when she died, she came back as other. <laughs> we don't know what. And apparently um, just now, for the first time in hundreds of years that she has been living, possibly thousands of years, she has to use the bathroom like a normal human like she has to relieve herself and so we get a nice little explanation of how disgusting she finds that and how she poops thank you sarah <laughs> but weirdly this sets off elaine asking a few questions because i guess when Omrin was coming back to the land of the living she could choose what form her body took and she was like i don't know i like women bodies so here i am and Elaine kind of starts asking her like, oh, you can change who you are? And Omrin immediately shuts it down. We don't know. You know, I just want to point this out. It's never confirmed that Elaine was talking about how to become human again, but Omrin took it as that line of questioning as her asking about how to become human. And Omrin just snaps and is like, it's not going to happen, girl. You are high fae. Get over it. And the atmosphere gets really ugly. Um, but then luckily Resand, because he's been doing this for hundreds of years, Resand makes some kind of joke and everybody laughs, including Elaine, and all is well momentarily. Because this was a cute moment, remember, Elaine laughed, right? Feyre decides to push her luck and go look for Nesta. Her and Resand end up heading out into Valeris. She's not at her apartment, and so they're like, let's go check every single bar 
in the city and they find her in the seediest bar. It's called the Wolf's Den and she is playing cards and swindling men out of money. As we could have all assumed, this talk does not go well. Feyre is basically begging Nesta to come for solstice. Nesta says, no. And Feyre even like goes so far as to bribe her. She's like, do you need money? Like what, what can I do to get you to come? And Nesta's like, there's nothing. I, I will not be there. And so Feyre pulls out the dad card and she's like, you know, dad would have wanted us to be together. Nesta immediately shuts that down. She's like, do not finish that sentence. Do not finish that thought. By the way, my rent is due at the end of the month. I would appreciate a check. Bye. And she leaves. Resand was standing outside because he just could not, could not be there. Will Nesta ruin the holidays? Stay tuned. Meanwhile, Resand and Moore are taking a walk. They are in the kind of old rich people area of Valeris and it got pretty wrecked in the attack and the rich people are rich so they could leave the city and they're just living nicely in the countryside versus like the not rich people who have nowhere else to go and are actually rebuilding the city, right? So anyway, they're walking around this like abandoned rich people area because they have a conversation that has been needing to have been had for a while. Go back to A Court of Wings and Ruin when in order to get the Court of Nightmares armies to help in the war, Resand promised Moore's father, Kier, that he could come and finally see Valeris. And this is the only place, literally the only place in their world that Moore doesn't have any memories of her family. It is purely hers, this untouched, beautiful place where she feels at peace. And so him giving Kier access to Valeris, even if it's just for one trip, um, without asking more in advance, really fucked more up mentally and their relationship. Like they've been through a lot, but it's something that they need to talk about. Resand apologizes and Moore is basically like, listen, I trust you. I've known you for hundreds of years. You're my cousin. And Resand is like, you know that I'm gonna do everything in my power to make this a quick trip. He's gonna be watched like a hawk. And he says, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that this is okay with you. So you call the shots. And basically they just end on good terms because they're two people that love and respect each other. And that's that, nothing more. And Resand trusts more so much that he lets her in on a little secret, that he has no fucking clue what to buy his wife for solstice. I want to like blow my wife away with like a romantic night out, what do I do? You said it. What? Blow <laughs> <laughs> your wife <laughs> He very specifically is like, more. I am not asking for your opinion because apparently more is notorious for giving the worst gifts in the world. <laughs> Resand has about 500 years worth of horrible presents that he has had to stuff into his drawer. So we finally found a little weakness in her armor. She has one imperfection. She can't buy gifts. Not her love language whatsoever. But she's good at diplomacy. And so Resand is like, okay, this has been a lovely chat, but I actually have a job for you. He's basically like, I'm doing everything that I can, but you are so much better than I am with this. Can you please go to the other courts and just speed this up? Like the peace treaty should have been done by now. Can you make that a priority? And, and he kind of recognizes that she needs to get out. Like she's just kind of hasn't really had a job since the war and she likes to be busy, just kind of like everybody it seems. Um, so he asks her, you know, do the night court a solid, please go be our little diplomat. She says, hey, can I think about it? But I think we all know, like she knows, we all know it's what she needs. Girlie's got a new job. Back in Feyre's point of view, turns out he's not the only one with the problem. Feyre has not a damn clue, not even a vague idea of what one gets the high lord of the night court. <laughs> for solstice. But then she and Elaine, who has finally left the kitchen, um, they're walking around Valeris. They're, I think they're still in the Threads and Jewel, the Palace of Threads and Jewels. When they come across this tapestry or like a fabric embroidery shop, they walk in and Feyre immediately sees this tapestry that is made of a fabric that is almost, it's not even black, like it's, it swallows light. It's just this alarmingly dark fabric and then it has this really beautiful shining silver embroidery all through it. When the shopkeeper comes out, Feyre is like, you need to tell me everything about this tapestry. And the shopkeeper is basically like, yeah, 
I get asked that about five times a day. So she is a fae and with her powers she created this fabric that she called the void she made it because her husband died in the war and she just could not deal she was so overcome with grief and so the only thing she could do like she needed to keep creating because that's her job as a craftswoman but the only thing she ended up making was this this void right but that silver thread she said i call that silver thread hope and Feyre is kind of like asking for a friend, but how do you keep creating through such grief? Like, how can you do something that you love? The weaver says, it's hard and it hurts, but if I were to stop, if I were to let this loom or spindle go still, there'd be no hope shining in the void. Feyre's mouth trembled and the weaver reached over to squeeze her hand, her calloused fingers warm against Feyre's. Feyre could offer no words to convey what surged in her chest, nothing other than... I would like to buy that tapestry. So basically the weaver is like, listen, I lost my husband. I didn't even, like, we don't have kids. I don't have anything to remember him by. So I just need to find little ways to keep going and creating that silver thread of hope helped her out. And so basically a lot of this book is just Feyre trying to deal with grief in the like in the grand scheme of things she didn't lose as much as a lot of people did her father died but she again really didn't have a strong relationship with her father like all of the people she was close with none of them passed away and so this book is really like her dealing with that dealing with the fact that she has the money to buy this tapestry that she has a house to go home to um it's a very melancholy book uh for being like a holiday novella um it's Feyre's, Feyre's having a rough time of it here. She ends up leaving Elaine. Elaine is like, I gotta go pick up some things, whatever. So Feyre ends up walking, and as always, she ends up in the rainbow, and she just kind of thinks about this tapestry that's in her bag, and she's thinking about how the first time that she felt really any progress in dealing with her grief was when she was painting at that painting club, and how this weaver had talked about how you need to create in order for there to be hope. She's like, you know, I've got a lot of money, I've got a lot of time, and I know how to paint. Wouldn't that be interesting if I gave people a space, like a creative outlet to deal with their grief? And she kind of puts a pin in that to talk to Resand about maybe that's one way that she can help. Like she can finally take the initiative instead of like the people of Valeris ordering her around and telling her what to do. Like maybe she can come up with her own thing and her own special way. So that's next on her solstice list. But it's solstice morning, baby, Feyre. It is the morning of solstice. Feyre's in bed, rolls over, and she's like, why is my pillow made of paper? And she realizes that her bed is covered in presents. Resand is sitting there like, oh, she's awake, she's awake, she's awake. He says, happy birthday, Feyre, darling. And she's like, god damn it, you remembered. <laughs> she doesn't like things being about her. So she's like, I was really hoping we wouldn't be doing this. But he's like, hmm. I do what I want. First present is a really beautiful sketchbook. It's like leather bound, gorgeous. It was a sketchbook that she would have picked out herself, which is always a good sign. So good job, Resan. The next one is a sky blue scarf of the softest wool. And the third is a new satchel for her painting supplies. Lovely job. Great work, Resan. Very just like good presents. <laughs> Feyre says thank you and then she's like kind of looking at Resan and she's like actually I think I know what I want to get myself for my birthday and Resan is like oh <sighs> she says remember that offer to draw you nude Resan's eyes glowed and he sprawled across the bed do your worst curse breaker they are in there for a long time when they finally come out to join the solstice party. Uh, Faber's new sketchbook is apparently almost already full of, uh, quote, his eyes, his wings, his tattoos, and enough of his naked, beautiful body that she knew she'd never share this sketchbook with anyone but him. And apparently, Resand checked her work and said she did a good job. <laughs> But the second they come out of their room, Cassian literally just kidnaps Resand. Just like, picks him up, Resand is gone, okay? Happy solstice, everybody. They apparently have some kind of tradition, and Resand through the bond is like, I'll be home for dinner, and zip, bat boys, yeah, out. I make money like so wet. Everyone else is kind of hung over in their rooms, so Feyre's like, oh, lovely, I'm gonna have a quiet morning. It's 
it's going to be so nice. And if you thought this was going to be a drama-free solstice, you are wrong uh, because Feyre walks into the kitchen because it smells delicious and surprise, surprise, who's in there? She never leaves. <laughs> Elaine, Nuala, and Caridwen are making a fruit tart. Good for them. When there is a knock at the door. As Elaine took a step back, hand falling away from the doorknob, she revealed Lucien, smiling tightly at us both. Happy solstice, was all he said. Ooh, Elaine's mate is here. They have an awkward chat of like, hello, how are you? And he's like, I'm fine, and you, thank you. When he like grabs something from his cloak and he's like, presents, got you some, not here to stay, open them up. Elaine is like, actually, I'm gonna go, and she just disappears like she always does. And so Feyre and Lucien, have a little chat. First of all, Lucian's like, how is Elaine, by the way? She's like, listen, man, you've got to give her time. Like, she was really in love with that human asshole, Grayson. Remember, she was engaged, and then he turned out to be, like, real nasty. She's trying to get over that, and she's like, honestly, if you were maybe around a little bit more, that might help. But the way that he's talking about it, he's kind of, like, he's obviously frustrated because, like, you found your mate. Yay, you're supposed to be, like, so happy, right? But this is not ideal at all. And he keeps using the words of like shackled and he just feels really upset that this isn't what it's supposed to be, you know? Um, so he's like, no, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to give her space. He's actually been out with Jurian and Vasa, who remember are kind of trying to figure out the whole issue with the mortal queens and like they're dealing with the mortal world, right? Um, so he's been with them and they call themselves the Band of Exiles because none of them actually have a place to call home anymore. They've all been kicked out of their respective homes. Which brings up, like, Lucian is like, because, you know, by the way, Feyre, remember, when you destroyed the Spring Court and how nobody trusts Tamlin, she used Lucian in that as well, so nobody trusts Lucian either. Like, even if Tamlin were to be friendly with him and, like, accept him back, the Spring Court doesn't like Lucian either, so, like, now his home, like, he can't be in the Autumn Court, He's not welcome in the spring court. He hates the night court. Fuck Sand, right? Where is he supposed to go? And his mate doesn't love him. Damn it, Sarah. He's basically like, I'm happy to be a part of building this peace, being a part of the whole like war restoration work, but I am not happy with how any of this went down. And he's like, by the way, the bigger box is for you, the smaller one's for her. Feyre glanced over her shoulder at the careful silver wrapping, the blue bows atop both boxes. When she looked back, Lucien was gone more pops out of the shadows where she was lurking with a bottle of wine. She's like, woo, 8 a.m. We need this. And she's basically like, listen, you didn't ask for my advice, but here it is. Just let Elaine sit for a little bit. She says, Elaine isn't ready. Neither is Lucian. Let him live with his little band of exiles. Let him deal with Tamlin in his own way. Let him figure out where he wants to be, who he wants to be. And the same goes for Elaine. She's like, I know you always want everybody to be happy, but like, we can't be happy right now. Look at you. You aren't happy either. So like, let's just let the dust fall for a second. She says, you want everyone to be happy and they will be eventually. It doesn't matter how hard you push them. And more is like, so let's be happy today. You know, we've got wine, we've got presents, we've got family. And Feyre's like, speaking of family, where are they at? They winnow to a cabin where apparently every winter solstice for hundreds of years, the bad boys come together for an epic snowball fight. They build snow forts and snow barricades and a snow battlefield. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, no magic, no wings, no rest. And by the looks of it, because they have reached the edges of the battlefield watching these soldiers fight, doesn't look like Resand is going to be the victor this year. In case you're wondering, because I know you are, Azriel won. Yes, Azzy. Apparently, this is his 199th victory. So, good for you, Az. <laughs> I have no feeling in my fingers or penis, but I think it was worth it. 
The next part of the tradition, after the annual snowball fight, all the boys go to the steam room and sit in the steam room naked because they can. And Feyre uses this opportunity to uh, send some naughty images down the mental bond to Resand. He says, quote, Feyre, it's bad form to be at attention while in the steam room, which only encourages her, and then a few seconds later, she hears a door slamming, followed by a distinctly male yelp, and then banging as if someone was trying to get back inside. So, Feyre got resand, kicked out of the naked steam room session, uh, because he got a little too excited, and Mary Solstice to us all. Anyway, but remember, the solstice, what is it actually? The longest night of the year. So as the sun finally begins to set, the real magic happens. They all gather to look out onto the darkening sky and Resand rolls out the cake. Cassian and Azriel didn't forget her birthday. They were just trying to be nice and like not rub it in her face, but now they're like, yeah, 21. It turns out that the twins and Elaine made the cake and Elaine specifically made it three tiers, each representing one sister. So there's one that has flames on it. There's one that has flowers for Elaine. Remember how, how Feyre like painted their rooms? right? And then the largest layer was stars. And Elaine says, it's because you're the foundation, Feyre, the one who always lifts us up. Oh, she's got to make a wish. Resand is like, what did you wish for? A simple, honest question. And looking at him, at that beautiful face and easy smile, at our family gathered around us, eternity, a road ahead, I knew. I didn't tell him though, not as I gathered my breath and wished. Hmm? And now it's time for presents. There are mountains, towers of presents in this living room. Apparently, Resand uh, organized it all. Everyone like gives their gifts to Resand, and then he will go and sort them and lock them in the room. Because Resand is apparently the only one that can be trusted not to snoop, like not to try and open the presents early. And Feyre looks at Azriel like, you're the spy master, right? Like king of secrets. I would say the most trustworthy of all the bad boys. And Amran just looks at Feyre and is like, even him. <laughs> They slowly start to open presents when they hear a knock at the door, just once, quick and hard. Feyre knew who it was, everyone did. Silence fell, interrupted only by the crackling fire. Feyre crossed the foyer and braced herself for the onslaught of cold, for the onslaught of Nesta. And yes, everyone was right, Nesta is standing at the door, pink cheeks covered in snow. She's got no jewelry on, no presents, just this gray dress, waltzes in, nods to Elaine, heads to the liquor cabinet. Omrin, who has not gotten up, just kind of shouts like, take that girl to the kitchen, not to the liquor. God, she's skin and bones. Nesta kind of freezes and everyone just braces. They're like, Omrin, God. Nesta slowly turns to Omrin, who just smirks at her and is like, happy solstice, girly. There is so much tension in this room until a ghost of a smile curved on Nesta's lips. Pretty earrings, she said to Omrin, and Feyre felt the entire room relax. Varian comes to the rescue because nobody knows what to say. Everyone's just sitting there in silence. Cassian absolutely has not spoken to Nesta. Baby, you look so beautiful, like so fucking hot. How, how, how are you? Dad. So Varian all of a sudden is like, wow, this is such a fun tradition. Let me tell you about how we do it in the summer court. And then he launches into this story and everyone is nodding like they're interested, but really they're just like, thank God it is not quiet anymore. And Nesta just finds a seat and starts drinking. Moore starts handing out her horrible gifts. Yes, uh, she got Asriel these bright blue embroidered towels. And he just kind of looks at them like, uh, tries to give Cassian his present, but she he doesn't even notice her because he's just like staring at Nesta and Moore's like Nesta is currently unwrapping her gift that Elaine got her and it is a box set of novels. I guess when Elaine went shopping, she found the bookstore that Nesta likes and got a recommendation and bought a shit ton of romance books. And Nesta says, thanks, but the words were stiff and gravelly. But now that she has opened her gift, Cassian can turn to Moore finally, who this whole time has been like, he grabs his gift and it is red silk underwear, because why not? <laughs> I'm not going to list every present that everybody gets, 
because I just cannot. But Feyre decided to gift the inner circle each a picture. Actually, she gets Amra and something, whatever. Um, but she gives Cassie and Azriel and more a painting of like a scene from their life that she made them and they all really appreciate it. But for Resand, she also gives him a painting and the painting is her self-portrait. The one that she painted and she was like, gonna throw this in a closet somewhere. I don't want anybody to see it. She gathered the courage to give it to Resand, who when he opened it, like doesn't show it to anybody, just so we're clear. With a very hoarse voice, he said, it's beautiful. Uh, Lucien gives Resand and Feyre three big old bottles of liquor with a note that says, you're gonna need this. <laughs> he got Elaine enchanted gloves that won't tear or become sweaty while gardening, which is super cute, but Elaine does not give a shit. Speaking of Elaine, Azriel picks up his last present to open and he's kind of looking around like, who gave me this? And she's like, ooh, ooh, that's from me, ha, <laughs> ha. And then gets real squirrely, <laughs> real nervous. Azriel's face didn't so much as shift, not even a smile as he opened the present and revealed, and he's kind of looking at it like, what the fuck is this? And Elena's like, oh, I, um, I had Majda make it for me, who, if you watch, my other video, I'm pretty sure I call her Magenta through the whole thing, but um, she's the Night Court's healer. Um, so Elaine talked to Magenta and it's a powder to mix into any drink. And the room is like, the fuck? <laughs> Elaine bit her lip and smiled sheepishly. It's for the headaches everyone always gives you since you rub your temples so often. Because he, as we know, Asriel puts up with so much shit, namely in the shape of Cassian. Yeah, Babe's got constant migraines from the people he chooses to be friends with. The room remained silent. Then Azriel tipped his head back and laughed. Feyre had never heard such a sound. So deep, so joyous. I feel like I've lost a friend today. <laughs> I feel like that's the takeaway from this whole thing. One can dream. Um, Everybody's laughing, joking, partying. It's all good. Things are going until like 2 a.m. Amrin and Varian dip. And a little bit after that, Nesta also leaves. She gives Elaine a little kiss on the cheek and then walks to the door. Feyre follows her, number one, to give her her rent check. Remember, Nesta was like, gotta pay my rent. Feyre gives her a check for like many months, so Nesta doesn't have to talk to her for quite a while. And also, Feyre was just hoping Nesta could say anything nice. She did say happy birthday at one point, but other than that, like nothing, nothing from Nesta. Okay, she just turns and walks out the door. Feyre hears the floorboard squeak behind her, and then she feels someone gently brush past her. It happened so fast, there was barely any time to realize that Cassian had gone storming past her, right out the front door, right after Nesta. He was trying so hard the whole night not to acknowledge her, not to look at her, and now he's running after her into the night. Buckle up, y'all we get a Cassian POV. And this is essentially exactly what went down. Carter, I thought that I could handle this, but I really can't. I'm gonna go. You know what? I'll tell you how it ends, okay? What are you doing? Something I should have done a long time ago. You thought, no ma'am, this is Cassian and Nesta we're talking about. So Cassian has had it up to here. He is through with this shit, the disrespect of his high lady. Nesta barely even said happy birthday. She was just a pill. She was totally ruining the solstice vibes, okay? He is going to cut into Nesta and when he finally catches up to her, she turns around and he realizes he has fucking nothing to say. Instead of saying how pissed and disappointed he is. He just says, I'm gonna walk you home. Oh, Cassian. Pretty immediately, he turns into a big old softy. We're in his brain and he's kind of like, I'm really mad that Nesta didn't talk to me all night. And then he's like, but I didn't talk to her either. Blah, 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 blah. He recognizes that he needs to give her space. After his first time in battle, it took him years to cope, but he still wants to walk her home. And they basically go back and forth for like 20 minutes of like, let me walk you home. No, oh, well, I just want some fresh air. So I'm gonna walk next to you. And she's like, please leave. And finally she looks down at his hands and she's like, what the fuck is that? 
Cassian got Nesta a solstice present. Yes, and he was too embarrassed to give it to her in front of everybody else. Immediately, Nesta is like, I don't want it. And Cassian's like, you're gonna want this one. And he really hopes so because it spent him apparently months getting this, whatever it is. So he's like, please, please take it. She says she doesn't want anything from him. To which Cassian is like, can somebody replay, replay that tape from the last book when she used her body as a shield to block him from certain death? When they talked about how the only regret they had is that they didn't have enough time for each other? Yeah, Nesta's never gonna live that down. They get into a hella fighting match. Um, Nesta is like, I want nothing to do with you. Get that through your thick skull. Please leave me alone. She says that she was dragged into this life. She doesn't want to be forced into their little happy family. And she walks away. Cassian's fingertips dug into the soft wood of the small box. And he was grateful the streets were empty as he hurled it into the river. Nesta never even touched the present. It never left his hands. Poor baby. Now, if you're wondering what's going on in Nesta's head, we actually get a mini Nesta POV. And she gets to her apartment, closes the door, slumps against it, and just slides to the ground. She's well aware that Cassian did follow her home to make sure that she got home safe. He flew really high above the clouds, but she could feel him. She also knows that he's waiting outside on a rooftop, waiting for her to turn on the light in her apartment, like to make sure she gets in fully safely. And part of her wants to be really petty and like not turn on the light to make him sit out there in the cold for a while. But she realizes she would just rather him like out of her life, please go away. So she turns on the light and then she looks down at the three months rent Feyre had handed her to her and she feels no shame. She apparently hasn't felt anything in months. She's had days where she doesn't really know where she was or what she's done. She feels hollow. So she simply drew her knees to her chest and stared into the dimness and sunk into the silence around her, feeling nothing. I'm telling you, this is the worst. This is a, such a melancholy book. We get all these cute opening presence moments and then it's just like trauma. Back at the house, everyone's back. Cassian finally is home. Uh, everyone else is asleep when Resand pulls Feyre aside to have a little chat. Uh, I didn't mention it, but Feyre got real dressed up for Solstice. She's wearing one of her favorite dresses and Resand is like, I love that dress on you, babe. And he's like, did I ever, did we ever talk about this? Like, you know who made those, right? And Feyre's like, no, they just showed up in my closet. Who, what do you mean? And Resand is like, I'm surprised you didn't figure it out. My mother made those. And I don't know, I feel like I wouldn't have put that together. So, I mean, we know that she's not good at riddles. So that was kind of a stretch, Resand. But yeah, his mom used to be a seamstress before she became mated to the High Lord. Um, and so she kept up the hobby and uh, made all of these dresses for his future wife. It's like she knew about the ring that he would give to the weaver. Like she set up everything. He didn't have to do anything for his bride, okay? He's like got the clothes, got the ring. And so everything is uh, thanks to Batmama. And then we just have like random thoughts. Like they're just having a nice little chat thinking about how Solstice went. And Feyre's like, by the way, I want to change these tattoos because she still has the eyeball tattoos on her hands where he used it to like spy on her low key. And Rhysand is like, sure, I don't need to spy on you anymore. We've got the mating bond. And uh, what does she want to change them to? The three mountain peaks and stars, which is what Resand has on his knees. And he kind of freezes and he's like, that's not a tattoo you can take off. Like apparently you can change every tattoo, except for when you get the mountains. And Feyre's like, well, good thing I'm planning on staying here for a while, I guess. And then she says, by the way, I have another present for you. And she takes his hand and sends an image down the mating bond. His hands began shaking around mine, and he said nothing until I retreated from his mind, until we were staring at each other again in silence. His breathing turned ragged, his eyes silver-lined. You're sure? He repeated. Yes, more than anything. I'd realized I'd felt it in the weaver's gallery. Would it be a gift for you? Feyre dared to ask, beyond measure. Reese said. Feyre wants a baby. Yes, so remember, go back to the Weaver where Feyre bought 
that tapestry. The weaver specifically said her husband died in battle and she didn't have any children, so it felt like she didn't have any piece of her husband left living in the world. And because of the war and like all of this death surrounding her, Feyre suddenly like, yeah, actually, wait, if Rhysand dies, I would like something to remember him by, so we should have a baby. It's also along the lines of like, you never know what's gonna happen, you can't wait for the perfect time for something. But basically that's what threw her is like post-war trauma and then the thought of not having anything of Rhysand. So baby season, it is. But remember, Faye, it's really difficult for Faye to conceive, so it's very likely that this will take hundreds of years for them to have a kid, right? And because of that, Rhysand is like, well, darling, we should get started tonight, shouldn't we? And Feyre's like, yes, I planned on that. <laughs> and because Sarah promised you a smutty holiday book, this is when we get Rhysand being like, I'm so happy you said yes because I've got a cabin and a wall with your name on it. We get classic Sarah J Maas, uh, heavy breasts that ache, knees buckling, and then we have the worst dirty talk in the world and it gets even worse when Feyre has the idea of like, wait a second, they start doing dirty talk through the, through the mating bond, telepathic sexy time. And then she's like, wait a second, if we can talk dirty in here, brilliant idea, Feyre, can we have sex in our minds? Resand kind of falters. Everything goes silent. Everything pauses. And then an undiluted, utter predator answers, it would be my pleasure. And then Feyre didn't have words for what happened. Feyre has no words, but Sarah J. Mass does. And so we learn that mind to mind, without bodies, somehow they have this very intense sexual experience while also physically having one and then everything shatters and ruptures into stars and galaxies and comets and there is nothing but pure shining joy ah. they take a moment they look at each other they're smiling they're so happy they look around the cabin that they have destroyed and she says do it again and they do they end up sleeping in the cabin, and when they wake up, instead of heading back to the townhouse, Rhysand takes her to that, like, rich people area that him and Moore were walking around. Do you remember with all the, like, mansions and stuff? And Rhysand is like, I gave you birthday presents, but you never asked me about my solstice present. Because Rhysand wants us to know that he's not one of the assholes that, like, combines gifts if you have a birthday that's near a holiday. Mm -mm, he's gonna give you two separate ones because he's the best you know? And he's like, well, here you go. And he points to a house. It's in ruins, okay? It's a fixer-upper because he wants Feyre to design it however she wants. Feyre is immediately like, okay, this is way too much, buddy. Like, this is over budget. Too much. And his face becomes deadly serious. Not for you, Feyre. It's never too much for you. And he wants her to build a house for the whole family. He's like, build yourself a studio, get me an office, build a Illyrian training ring, a library for Amran and Nesta, a big closet for more. And while you're at it, why don't you design a nursery? Because I'm going to put a baby in you. And then we get a strange turn of events. After introducing her to her future home, Rhysand leaves Feyre to, I don't know, I think she's hanging out with Asriel, whatever. He's like, I gotta, I've got one last little solstice thing to do. So he zips out of the night court, and where do you think he goes? Mm. Yeah, Rhysand winnows over to the spring court, and Tamlin looks worse than before, if that's even possible. Rhysand is like, hey, Tammy, okay, I realized that we need to compromise, and he talked to Varian, and apparently they're gonna get the summer court soldiers to come help Tamlin with his border issues because Tamlin said he didn't want the night court soldiers there. So he's like, there you go, you don't have to deal with me, happy solstice. But Tamlin doesn't respond to that. Instead, he says, do you think Feyre will ever forgive me? Do you think you will ever forgive me? Because remember, Tamlin is also a part of the whole thing that got Rhysand's mom and sister killed, okay? Rhysand is basically like, honestly, dude, I don't remember you ever apologizing, first of all, and, uh, 
you're asking a lot. And Tamlin's kind of like, yeah, well, it's not like an apology would really make a difference anyway. Again, Rhysand is kind of pissed because he doesn't know how to deal with this kind of Tamlin, right? He likes the fighting Tamlin, okay? So he's sort of like, damn, this boy's broken. And I didn't mention this, but kind of over Solstice, Lucian pulled Rhysand aside because Lucian had seen Tamlin since they had their little run-in. And Lucian was like, I get why you're pissed, but like what you did when you went to visit Tamlin, like you're just kicking a man while he's down. So you do admit that's a douchey thing to say. I could have been nicer. It was just a dick move, my man. So Rhysand decides to use a little bit of magic to whip up some food for Tamlin because Tamlin, be, like they don't have any household staff now. So Tamlin has to go and hunt for his food and he just had like an elk bleeding out on his kitchen table. And Rhysand was like, ugh not on solstice so he whips up some food for tammy and he's like bud can you just do me a favor and just eat this wasn't forgiveness and it wasn't kindness Rhysand could not and would not ever forget what he'd done to those he'd loved most but it was solstice or it had been yesterday and perhaps because Feyre had given him the greatest gift he could ever dream of he said you can waste away and die after we sort out this new world of ours and Rhysand vanished on a dark wind. And then because we cannot have peace, Sarah gives us a more POV again, and it only leads to more questions. Um, so Moore is planning on visiting the Winter Court for a little bit. Remember, she's real friendly with uh, the soon-to-be High Lady of the Winter Court. Apparently, um, ever since Feyre became High Lady, all of the wives of the High Lords are sort of like, so she's gonna go visit her friend before embarking on Rhysand's little diplomacy tour, right? But before she goes to the winter court, she just needs some time to herself. And so when we link up with Moore, she is riding a horse through a snowy forest. She is heading to her top secret mansion that no one knows about. She bought it um, about 300 years ago to decompress, okay? And as she's riding there, she's going through the woods, she sees a dark shadow. It's not like Azrael's shadow. It was something different and it was looking back at her. And Moore was just like, not today, not today. And she just like jets. She gets the horse running real fast to her mansion, okay? But as she speeds away, she wonders what else she might see in these lands where none in the night court had ventured for millennia. And that's that. So what we learn is that according to Cassian, there's weird shit in the mountains that people don't know about. Moore has a secret power and Azrael has powers that we don't know where they came from, his shadows. But that's for another day. And in case you're wondering, Feyre did open up her painting studio. It is open, free for the public. Nobody needs to pay for any supplies ever. Uh, she just wants a place, a safe place for people to explore their creativity and safely sift through all of their emotions. When they finally get it ready, her and Racina are waiting. Everything is set up. They're really excited. And Feyre just gets this sudden panic of like, no one's going to come. They op they're like, get here at 10. It's 10 o'clock. They open the doors and no one is there. And Feyre is just panicking. She's like, maybe nobody got the invitations. Nobody saw the flyers. Oh my God, what if they hate me? What if this was a bad idea? What if this was a failure? And then she hears footsteps approaching the studio. 10 children and some of their parents come waltzing in. Yes, Feyre would instruct one day. Racina would take the other days. Feyre turns to face the families gathering at the door. The room was open and sunny around them. She smiled and began. After their first class, which is a hit by the way, Rhysand comes to pick up his wife from work and they just go for a little walk. And Feyre is like, honestly, I'm excited to wake up every day. Which remember, Rhysand remembered seeing her when she was not excited to wake up every day. She spent like almost the entire A Court of Mist and Fury book not wanting to be alive. Um, so for him to hear that, it's, that's the best solstice gift, babe. That's what she got him. She says, I know there are things we have to face, but despite them, my life is so very happy and I'll never stop being grateful that you are in it. To the stars who listen, Feyre, 
Rhysand said. I brushed a hand over his cheek to wipe away the last of his tears, and we turned down the street that would lead us home, toward our future and all that waited within it. To the dreams that are answered, Rhysand. There you go. Happy holidays, happy end of the year, whatever you celebrate. I hope that the end of 2023 treats you well. I'll see you next year. Love to you always. This, again, like these videos bring me so much joy. You guys all do. So truly thank you for being in my life. And yeah, I just hope that 2024 is bright for all of us. And sending love always. Bye. In the end, the greatest snowball isn't a snowball at all. It's fear. Merry Christmas.